but then you're also saying that this is not 1967 when you're going to Northwestern. This is um, uh, you know 2022, and that the world has changed, and that we need to, uh, for example, not engage in affirmative action. Uh, you've been, I think, you know, against and then for and then against affirmative action. Where do you stand? Let's just ask specifically. Yeah, I was for it, then I was against it, then I was for it, and now I'm against it. That I've got a you know flip flop. Yeah, but uh, but you know, rather than give a long thing about where where I stand, I mean, I'll, I'll say where I stand, which is I I think it's the I think the 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 uh, jig is up. Uh, I think the proverbial SHIT has hit the fan. Uh, we're 50 years into the affirmative action era. And I just think it cannot be allowed to become a permanent and institutionalized manner of functioning to secure so-called equity, the presence of African-Americans in elite venues to use different criteria of assessing their fitness. That cannot be allowed to happen. That it happened historically is understandable. But um, what we're doing is we're, we're creating a regime where the very idea of equality will become impossible to obtain. Uh, because, and, and, and where we are inviting a kind of money illusion with respect to productivity, a kind of blurring of standard, a, a kind of self-imposed blindness. So it's not to expose the consequences of, 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 of what we wanna do. Let me just be very clear about this. Where you can assess the relative merits of candidates for a competitive position with more or less objective means. If you select from the right tail and you use different cutoffs for different population groups, as a consequence with large numbers on average, there's going to be significant disparities in the performance of the people after they've been selected. Right. So, so that's not equality. And, and that means that a black kid coming out of Stanford and a white kid coming out of Stanford are gonna be viewed differently by the marketplace. Uh, the quality because of because on average they're going to be different. I mean, I, I just want to follow it through to the very uncomfortable conclusion. Yes, correct. They're going to be perceived differently by rational actors in the marketplace, who of course will never say that they in fact do so, and may nevertheless hire and do whatever they want to do, notwithstanding the fact that they perceive it. That's my point. This is insidious. But, but this is a multi-layered corruption where. You're trying to make up for the fact that the Blacks haven't, on average, produced as much talent. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Talent at what? Talent at academic economics, talent at uh, stem cell disciplines, talent at uh, uh, the kind of research that underlies medical advance, talent at engineering, et cetera. You, you, you've got a disparity in the first place because the test scores are different. The test scores are just a noisy measure of the talent of the people who are being vetted. So that's the problem. That's the thing that has to be confronted and must be addressed. It must be reversed. Okay, but the, if you use affirmative action, I'll just finish as the as the response to that situation, you're building the inequality in and then blinding yourself to. Okay, so but the counter argument would be, I think, going back to Glenn one or Glenn two, whatever version of Glenn we taught, because you could, you know. It's Glenn one and Glenn three. I'm Glenn four now. Glenn one and Glenn three were for affirmative action. Glenn two and Glenn four are against it. I think you're the most <laughs> articulate advocate of affirmative action and the most articulate advocate uh, against affirmative action. And uh, so the articulate Glenn for affirmative act action would say, well, look, we should really uh, uh, accept that cost of, uh, let's make half the, for a decade, let's make half the Stanford class and every top Ivy schools class black so that we now have, uh, you know, 20 years later, a black elite, uh, a bigger black elite. We have a lot of, you know, elite um, black members of society in terms of, you know, role models, in terms of uh, 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 changing uh 
the distribution of bequests, the distribution of in in income, uh, the uh, 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 the distribution of knowledge that is passed uh, is held and also passed from generation to generation. That uh, that we haven't done affirmative action uh, big time. That the problem we're facing now is that uh, is because we haven't actually done enough of it. Not that we've done too much of it. How do you respond to Glenn One? Uh, he could be right, actually. I mean, I didn't know that it was me who was the one making that argument. After a while, I, I was just listening to the argument and it sounded like it could be right. It could be right. So suppose we think about it like the way we're trained to think about it as, as uh, economic, you know, dynamic analysis and whatnot. And you started out in year zero, which is let's say 1964 or whatever. And then you had the optimal adjustment path where you were gonna formulate your dynamic policy, taking all of the various considerations into account of how you are gonna to try to narrow because you know there's rising marginal cost of doing the egalitarian thing. I mean, you don't wanna do it all at once and you wanna kind of spread it out and there are dynamic interacting effects and you gotta take them into account. So suppose we were doing a Kotlikoff like dynamic model of what the optimal transition path should look like. In that world, what you just described might be right, which is two things. One, you should be doing affirmative action in years zero through 50 to some extent. And you should be doing a lot of it in year zero, one, two, three, four, five, relative to years 35, 40, 45. Both of those statements might be correct. Maybe we didn't do enough. It was certainly controversial from the very start. That's what people say about some of the poverty programs in the great society, they weren't big enough and so forth and so on. Maybe I've got my doubts about the poverty programs, but it might be true about affirmative action. It might be. And maybe we didn't do the right kind because there's a pipeline issue and there's a question of where you invest and so forth. And the incentives are all wrong and it's a collective action problem. The incentives for the people making the decisions about affirmative action are to cover their asses and to take care of their own particular institutional interests. They don't have a systemic model in mind when they make those decisions. And it may be that any single one of them making a decision like relying less on preferential admissions to you know, meet a threshold of minority presence would not do any good unless all of them did it and they can't coordinate on all of them doing it. So that guy, the early Glenn, in the, when I was coming out of MIT, I was. I mean, I was saying you can't go colorblind. You can't just be laissez-faire. That was my, you know, I said, you got either racial justice orientation or you got laissez-faire, let the chips fall where they may, you know, kind of libertarian orientation. And I'm saying, uh, you can't, I had a correspondence with the great Robert, Robert Nozick, you know, the philosopher, you know, who had this entitlement theory of uh, uh, justice, where he said, if you start out with claims that are legitimate and people transact, anything that comes about is also legitimate as a consequence of those uh, uh, fair transactions. And I'll say, but if the starting line is blurred because of history, just like you said, you have to do something. So I agree with that. I agree that that might have been retrospectively a sensible speech in 1980. But we're in 2022 and uh, the ground is shifting beneath our feet. I think the, you know, the fact that it's Asians, quote unquote, I, I don't like this kind of generic, you know, these people are very different among themselves. But in any case, it's students for fair admissions who are an Asian group who are bringing these lawsuits against UNC and Harvard challenging affirmative action in elite higher education is beyond ironic. It is, it is it, in so many levels uh, uh, exposing the uh, thinness and inherent contradictions of this, of this uh, view that, that, we're, that we're carrying with us now. The country is changing. It's not black and white anymore. This is not 1960. This is 2022. The world is small. The world is very small. People are moving around. So um, locking in this, uh, depend I'll repeat myself, locking in this dependency. This is the late Glenn. I'm explaining the difference between the early Glenn and the late Glenn. That train left the station. We missed our chance. We are where we are now. And the late Glenn says, uh, it's time to man up and woman up. Let's the chips fall where they may. Let's, you know, 
literally where they may, would, would, I, would, would I admit a class without any black students in it at a place like Harvard? Of course not, of course not. But um, have you looked at those data? <coughs> RC, I mean, I, 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 just for a moment, just for a moment. Okay. Peter R.C. Diacono, Duke uh, labor economist, who's the expert witness for the students for fair admission. David Card, Nobel honoree, expert witness for the uh, Harvard. Harvard. Yeah, right. And Card says, and here's the argument. He says, look, we could fill up the class with high test scores if we wanted to. We're not just interested in test scores. We're interested in many qualities of the students. And when you take those qualities into account, we're not discriminating. And R.C. Diacono says, Stratify the applicant pool over a 10-year period by decile of their academic qualifications and index of test scores and grades, the 10th, the 20th, the 30th percentile, and so forth. Conditional on decile and ethnicity. What's the probability that you fall in that decile? What fraction of the Black applicants fall in the fourth decile of the distribution of academic qualifications, the second, the third, the 10th? And conditional on decile, what's your chance of being admitted? That, so that he's got these two tables. To me, these two tables. So when you look at the applicant pool, of course, application is endogenous. Everybody out there in the world, we're economists over here. So hold on, hold on. Okay, we're going to actually talk a little bit. Application is a choice. The pool of people who he is looking at who have applied have self-selected. I'm aware of that. Uh, almost two-thirds of the Black kids are in the bottom two deciles of the applicant pool. Mm -hmm. Almost... Uh, Two thirds of Asian kids are in the top two deciles of the applicant pool. Those numbers are only slightly off. Conditional on being in a decile, let's say the seventh, you're between the 70th and 80th percentile of the, of the uh, stratification of applicants by academic qualification. If you're Black, you got a 35 or 40% chance of being admitted. If you're Asian, you got a 10% or a 7% chance of being admitted. If you're in the top two deciles and you're black, of which only like about 5% of the black population are, you've got a 50% chance of being admitted at Harvard. And if you're Asian, you've got a 15 or a 20% chance of being admitted. Yeah. So I'm just saying, no, I, I we're, agree. We're Maybe. twisting ourselves into a privilege. And I think the, the guys like Clarence Thomas are right about this. Come on, you all can get mad at me if you want to. We're talking about the Constitution of the United States of America and about the law, about the order under which we're going to govern ourselves. You can't have on this argument, which is why I signed on, state actors making that kind of racially discriminatory discretionary decision with the protection of the, uh, the Constitution behind that. That's, that's a problem for our country. It's not the solution. This is not the answer. We have, a, we have a problem. The inequality must be dealt with. Changing the standards and discriminating in this way is not the answer. Mm 